All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we've got, I've got about 2.33 Eastern time. So welcome everyone for um, to today's uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, General Thoracic Surgery Database uh, monthly webinar. Today is Wednesday, August the 10th. I can't believe we are halfway through, almost halfway, excuse me, almost halfway through August. I cannot believe it. Um, can you hear me okay, Carol? Everyone, yes, yes, all right, perfect. I got the fancy new headset from Kevin while I was in um, Chicago last week when I was in the office, so I'm super excited. So. Yeah, you sound great. You sound all great. Right. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, so let's go ahead and just quickly review the agenda. Um, but before that, on the call with me today, I have myself and Carol Crone and Emily Conrad from STS. From our IQVIA team, we have Jean, Joe, and Melanie, and we have Ruth Riley, our GTSD consultant on the line um, for today's webinar as well. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I don't have a lot of um, new updated information since our last call. I'll just provide some brief STS updates, um, quickly touch on AQO as well. Um, then we'll turn things over to Ruth for our education and then we'll have our brief update from IQVIA. And then as usual, we'll end the, um, end the call with um, any questions or concerns that you all have. Um, please be sure to um, Submit your questions via the Q&A and not the chat, um, but again, just submit those via Q&A. Um, we do have the raise hand function enabled. If you would like to raise your hand and talk, um, you're also welcome to do that. Just be sure that uh, you have your microphone enabled so, um, so you're able to talk to us. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and hop in. Let's see, um, training manual for August will be posted by the end of the day today. Um, hopefully by the end of the day, um, Kasha will be able to get that posted. If not, it'll be up um, definitely by tomorrow at the latest. So um, that will be um, coming again either today or by tomorrow. Um, the spring 22 analysis results obviously were released. They were um, the lung and esophageal composite reports were posted on the platform on July 11th. And the participant results for the benchmark and legacy reports are um, scheduled or slated to be released for this weekend. And Mel and her team will have more information on that in their update. But of course, those benchmark and legacy reports will be coming out this weekend. Um, and then STS will send an official communication um, to the participants letting you all know that um, those reports are active and in the platform and ready for um, for you to take a look at. Of course, any report related questions should be directed um, to GTSD tech support um, at IQVIA.com. Again, um, report related questions should go there and then STS will be looped in um, as needed. In regards to IQVIA platform, um, you all did receive a notification on Monday from STS that the participant um, ID specific contact list is now available to you all. So if you um, want to see the current contacts that are available for your site, you can now check those out in the platform. I'm going to pull this over um, real quick. And any of you have not had a chance to take a look at that. Um, let me go ahead and sign in real quick. And I'm just going to use the my tell me your report. So the um, participant contact list can be found under the operational reports. So click on operational reports. And here you'll see the new report, the contact list report. And again, this report identifies um, all the contacts associated with your site. I believe with the exception of the billing contact and the contract contact. So everyone except your billing and contract contact will be listed here. But if you just click on contact report list and that report will come up for you. Um, I don't expect any information here in my report as this is a, a dummy site. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the report itself look like, looks like, um, it would look like this. It would have all the contact names, all the surgeons, prim um, your primary data and file contact, your backup contacts, um, all of them listed here, as well as with their associated role. So you can see who SDS currently has listed for you um, as contacts for your site. Um, if you have any questions about that report, if you need to add new user accounts or deactivate current users that you have listed there, um, you will need to still go through the same process, complete the STS participant contact form. Um, there's a link to the form here. Also, the form can be found on the website um, from our STS National Database homepage. If you scroll down um, under important resources and click on database forms. The participant contact form is here as well as the schedule A for surgeons and schedule B for um, anesthesiologists. 
All right. Um, and if you have any questions about completing the participant contact form, please reach out to Jane and Addie and team at stsdb at sts.org. And Addie will be able to assist you with any questions on completing that form and getting those um, updates um, made to the database. Um, also, just a reminder, our fall 22 harvest is currently underway. Um, the harvest is scheduled to close on September the 9th, so we are just about, we are four weeks out. So again, that harvest is scheduled to close on September 9th. It does include data up through 630 2022. So please be sure and get in all of your cases that cover this most recent six month reporting period. Um, if you do not have any cases um, included in this most recent six months, um, of the first six months of 2022, we do um, ask that you opt out of that current of the uh, current harvest. Um, if you have any questions about that, please just let us know. Um, also, you can feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions as well. Um, again, the harvest is scheduled to close September the 9th, and the opt-out date is September the 13th. And again, it does include data up through June 30th of 2022. Um, again, the slide from the last from our last call, no new updates here. Public reporting website um, was posted, uh, updated July 11th. That um, public reporting up, uh, website um, does reflect data from the fall 21 harvest um, with the data from July 1, 2018 through June 30th of 2021. If you have any questions regarding public reporting, please reach out to Sydney Clinton directly, um, and Sydney would be able to answer all things public reporting regarding um, consents, um, anything related to the website itself and the data that's currently displayed. Um, again, please reach out to Sydney directly. Um, we did make some updates to the public reporting website, so some improvements and enhancements, so we encourage you to check that out as well. The 2022 audit is underway. Um, again, all sites have been notified that were selected. And again, for those sites that are currently undergoing the audit, um, please reach out to CS CRS with any audit related questions. All right, AQO um, is coming up. We are scheduled for AQO October 26th through the 28th in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so we are looking forward to um, AQO this year. Um, AQO registration is currently open. And just a reminder that to in order to receive that early bird registration, you do need to um, register by Friday, August the 26th. So again, that early bird pricing for STS members for the virtual pass is 300. Um, one track 550, 900, and 1150. Um, and then for our non members, again, the prices are listed here 650, 1100, 1450, and 400 for the virtual pass. And then our standard prices go into effect after August 26. So again, we do encourage you to get registered um, by Friday, August the 26th to get um, take advantage of that early bird pricing. Um, also, again, just this slide to give you the um, what you get versus in-person versus the virtual pass. Again, um, the one thing we do want to continue to emphasize is the virtual pass. It is important to remember that this is not a live streaming event. So um, you will not be live streamed on um, as the conference is happening in person in Providence, Rhode Island. All of the live in-person contact will, content will be recorded and will be available um, to you all in mid-November. So again, um, the virtual pass, your um, content will be available. The live recorded sessions of the in-person, the recorded in-person sessions will be available mid-November. All of the on-demand content will be available for everyone in mid-October. Also, just um, wanted to let you know the preliminary agenda has been posted to the STS website. Um, so you can um, go out and take a look for um, the prelim agenda. If you go to STS meetings, live courses, scroll down to advances in quality and outcomes, you can view the preliminary agenda here, as well as um, get registered, um, just request a justification letter, registration form, book hotel, all of your um, AQO related information can be found here on this um, website, on this page. So again, um, the preliminary agenda can be found here. All right, what else? Um, also, just a reminder um, to go ahead and book your rooms. STS does have a block of rooms reserved for a um, special AQO rate of 259. And that is, of course, guaranteed through Tuesday, October the 4th. 
Um, and also just a reminder that STS is going green this year, so all materials will be posted. And we do encourage you to print those out and bring those with you if you are a paper kind of person. Um, again, we do encourage you to print those out and bring those with you to the meeting um, so you can have that um, handy to take notes um, and have all of the slides and all of that information with you again. Um, that will need to be handled prior to you coming to Providence and just bring all of those materials with you. Um, I think that's it, Emily. Did I miss anything for AQO? I just wanted to mention that the PowerPoint slides, handouts, case scenarios, data collection forms, um, we'll link all of that out on the virtual meeting platform. So when you attend live, um, I would suggest, um, you know, pulling that up either on your phone or if you're going to bring a laptop or um, an iPad, um, having that open. It, um, during the meeting would uh, also be an alternative to printing anything out. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. All right. So next, I'm going to turn things over to Ruth um, so she can address her um, STS education points. Ruth. OK, here we go. So uh, please remember that when uh, when you submit something to the FAQ mailbox to include a correct email address, and uh, select the correct database version when you enter those, as well as all the other starred information. Um, these are updates to the training manual for August that will be published either later today or tomorrow. Um, this is not all of them. This is just a sampling. Uh, sequence 610, history of vascular disease, documented peripheral arterial disease is captured um, by selecting the option for major aortic or peripheral vascular, vascular disease. So again, peripheral arterial disease is also called peripheral vascular disease and can be captured. Uh, sequence 650, history of cancer. Um, so one of the data managers kindly pointed out that we um, had uh, not allowed for patients being actively surveyed for um, malignancy to be included in either none or coexisting cancer. We had excluded them from both groups. And so uh, we went back and reevaluated, and the decision was made that patients who are um, being actively surveyed for an active primary malignancy are um, included in coexisting cancer. Um, and so to try and make that as clear as possible, um, I added that clarification in the training manual and also um, added a strike through to the coexisting cancer um, section. So hopefully that is helpful and comprehensive. Uh, sequence 685, preoperative thoracic radiation therapy for patients that have synchronous primary lung cancers, one of which that gets treated with SBRT and the other of which is surgically resected, which happens uh, fairly often, um, you would select the appropriate unrelated disease option to account for the SBRT that, uh, that um, has occurred for the non-resected lesion. So if the SBRT was uh, within six months of the re resection, you would choose option three. And if it was uh, further out than that, then you would choose number four. And again, that specifically relates to patients with synchronous primary, not patients with metastatic disease. Next slide. Sequence 3800, pneumothor pneumothorax requiring chest tube. This one's kind of a bummer, but sort of the way that it's been all the way along. So it's consistent, I think, with how we've coded it over the years. For patients who accidentally or intentionally remove their chest tube and develop a pneumothorax requiring a chest tube to be replaced, you do code yes to 3,800. Um, I know that it doesn't necessarily um, seem fair, but I think what makes it fair is that it's consistent for all of the patients that get entered into the registry. And um, we all have those patients that accidentally get out of bed and step on their chest tube on the way to the bathroom. Next slide. Sequence 4270, readmission within 30 days of discharge. So in July, we updated the sequence um, to indicate that you would code no to readmission within 30 days of discharge if the readmission was planned and unrelated to the thoracic procedure performed. We got a lot of questions about why um, thoracic procedures, why that unrelated to the thoracic procedure performed statement was made. And so the decision was made to amend that. So now any readmission, uh, you would code no for any readmission within 30 days of discharge if it was planned preoperatively. And it's very important that it was planned preoperatively. So this is not 
patients who had something occur in the hospital. Um, if it's related to the thoracic procedure or not, you're going to code no. So a preoperatively planned readmission for chemotherapy would not be captured as a readmission any longer. Uh, sequence 1470, uh, esophagectomies that are completed with a minimally invasive approach with the exception of only the neck portion are coded as minimally invasive. So patients will have uh, what is called a robotic esophagectomy. There is not a robotic approach to that uh, fairly superficial neck incision that occurs commonly in practice. Those are coded as minimally invasive, even though that, that neck portion is technically open. Next slide. Sequence 1470 procedure. This is an important clarification. So there's currently not a separate code for VAT or robotically completed sleeve lobectomies. Some sites were therefore selecting, um, so I, I think like the VATS code for lobectomy, not wanting to call their sleeves open procedures. But the correct thing to do for VATS and robotic sleeve lobectomies is to use uh, code 32486, which is the open uh, sleeve lobectomy procedure code for every approach to sleeve lobectomies until um, the next release, I think, when we can add a, uh, a thoracoscopic robotic um, approach specifically for sleeve lobes. Next, sequence 1510, primary lung cancer resection performed. Um, wedge resections are really tricky. Um, I get a lot of questions about whether a re wedge resection is diagnostic or therapeutic. Um, the intent going into the OR um, is sometimes makes it confusing. Surgeons will say that it's diagnostic, but at the end, they feel like they've resected all of the disease. And because of a patient's comorbidities, they may elect not to do an anatomic lung resection. And we'll just consider the wedge resection, the therapeutic treatment. Um, I very often have to go back to my surgeon and ask her, was this one therapeutic or diagnostic? And we talk about it and I keep track of my notes so that if I get audited, I've got solid documentation on why I coded something as therapeutic or didn't abstract it at all because it was simply diagnostic. Um, and so your surgeon is probably gonna be your best resource for that um, information. Um, if something is like a stage one lung cancer and all future plans are just to survey them after a wedge resection, that's a good sort of hint. Um, but a lot of them are a lot more complicated than that. And, um, and you'll just have to check with your surgeons. Or I'm happy to read through op notes, but your surgeons can probably tell you um, in 2.5 seconds. My surgeon loves to tell me these things. Next slide. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, um, Nancy had asked if we could go over 4270 again. 4270, yep. yes, sure. Oh. So uh, the clarification here really is to just align everything. It doesn't matter whether the readmission is related or unrelated to the thoracic procedure. If it was pre-planned, pre-operatively, and the patient gets readmitted within 30 days, you would code no to readmission. So it doesn't matter if your patient had uh, a lobectomy for lung cancer and the readmission is for chemotherapy because the patient has lung cancer. If the surgeon knew that going into the OR that they were going to readmit that patient on post-op day 20 for chemotherapy, you would code no to readmission. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. All yep. right. So, okay. Yep. So let's go, but let's see any other questions um, regarding that. Let's go ahead and um, hop over to Joe real quick so he can give us updates. I see a few questions, but we have uh, we have plenty of time. So let's go ahead and turn things over to Joe. Thank you, Leanne. Mm -hmm. um, just a few items from us today. Um, uh, some of these Leanne actually mentioned earlier on. Um, the GTSD risk adjusted report updates will be released this weekend on August 12th, and a notification will be posted to confirm the availability of those reports. Uh, so this release will include the updates to re-enable the other reports, benchmark reports, and legacy reports on all of your harvest reports. Um, and it will also re-enable that print and export button uh, so that you can uh, export your reports to PDF on your own, uh, especially once you get those updated versions, that functionality should be restored. And then um, I believe I mentioned these on our previous call, but just a reminder, um, 
we are looking to make updates on the risk adjusted dashboard. Um, these will also be going be going in on the August 12th update this weekend. Um, STS 8562 and 8563 for both lung cancer and esophageal cancer staging procedures. Uh, we will be updating report logic to include the uh, 5.21.1 data version changes uh, for identified variables that were discontinued and replaced. And so essentially that means we'll be updating the reports to align with the latest data version for you. Right. And that's all we have for today. Um, our usual reminders to let us know if you have any outstanding questions and follow up with us uh, by email if you have any uh, concerns. And then we'll be posting to the notification section as we um, get those items out for release for you. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks so much, Joe. All right, um, and here's my contact for information. If you guys have any questions for uh, regarding anything, just feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, also, STS database um, operational questions should go to stsdb at sts.org. Um, our upcoming webinars, just wanted to point out our next user group call um, is scheduled for August 24th. Um, excuse me, at 2.30 Central. Um, then our next monthly is September 13th at 1.30 Central. And then we also have a new data manager webinar um, that's going to be held September 28th at 2.30 Central. Um, if you have any suggestions um, for new data manager webinar content, anything um, that you think would be beneficial for our new data managers, um, please feel free to email those ideas to myself or Ruth. We're going to be working on updating the current um, new data manager um, presentation that's currently out in our on our STS YouTube page. Um, but again, um, that new data manager webinar will be September 28th. It will be recorded um, if you're not able to attend. So um, just know that it will be available um, just as our all of our other webinars to go back and review at a later date and time if you're not available. And you can also share those with um, share the link to these webinars with any of your coworkers as well. So your colleagues. So um, all right. And that's all that I have for today. Um, I see we've got some questions coming in. So let's go ahead and tackle some of these. Um, some of these are, most of these look to be clinical. Um, before we hop into those um, questions, Ruth, there's one question from Angie. If you elect to opt out of the upcoming harvest, what is involved with opting back in for future harvest? So the opt out process is harvest specific. So if you opt out of this um, fall 22 harvest, you just need to complete the opt out form on the STS website. Um, but you don't have to um, opt back in for future harvest. So it's just you. it just tells us that you're opting out of the fall 22 harvest and then you are free to start um, at the, you know, the close of that um, fall 22 harvest, you're free to, you know, start entering data and submitting data for the next harvest. You don't have to opt back in for future harvest. So technically you're always opted in until you um, opt out. I guess that's a, another way of saying it. Hopefully that didn't confuse you, but, um, but again, there's no, no specific, you don't have to opt back in once you opt out of a harvest. All right, let's see here. All right, Ruth, our next questions. Sure. Let's see a well, first one. Sequence six ten. I don't know if you do you have the train manual up and you want to screen share. I do. I do, I do, I do. Six ten. Yeah. All right. I don't know why this does this when I hold on. See. I don't know why the training manual does that. Okay. Control F six ten. Okay. Da, 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 da. So that's twenty six ten. Uh, 4610. There it is. Hiscular, history of vascular disease. So DVT is captured in history of vascular disease, which is a multi select field. So you can choose as many of these as apply. DVT has its own um, choice, which is number three. You wouldn't select both number two and number three if the patient's only um, history of vascular disease is, in fact, the DVT. Um, the next question is also about 610. Is PAD diagnosed by anesthesia enough for coding? Does the patient need to have documented symptoms of PAD by other um, providers? So um, no, the documentation by the anesthesiologist is, is enough for coding. If you standardly include documentation by your anesthesiologist as part of where you pull your preoperative evaluation from, so um, when I created, uh, like I created a source document for where I abstract my data from, I did not include my anesthesia HP information. I didn't feel like it was necessarily always the most accurate. And then when I got audited, um, 
I didn't provide those uh, notes to the auditor because none of my pre-op eval stuff came from there. Um, so it's, it, you can use it. Um, if your anesthesiologists do a great job of um, documenting histories, um, feel free to use it. I would just include it as your source document and then you need to routinely um, use it and provide it in case of audit. For post-operative events, what do you code hydropneumothorax under? Um, it would depend. Um, I think if you can send your specific example to me, that would yeah. be helpful. Then FAQ, and then probably include your um, your notes, your like uh, your post-op note where that event is noted. For item 3800 pneumothorax with chest tube, does this only count chest tubes done in the OR and exclude chest tubes done in places like IR? I do not see anywhere in the training manual that specifies in the OR for 3800. No, um, so the the question was not, um, I don't know if you wanna pull that slide back up. Oh, sorry, yes. No, uh, it's okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So chest tubes are routinely placed in the OR as part of lung resection or other resections. Um, and so people were um, saying like, my patient had this chest tube as part of a routine OR case. We would have been fine, except for the patient dislodged the chest tube that was placed in the OR. Um, so I was trying to provide clarification that the, it, it doesn't matter why the chest tube falls out um, and the pneumothorax occurs. If a pneumothorax occurs, a pneumothorax occurs and you code yes to 3,800. I guess, similarly, if the chest tube had originally been placed in IR and the patient accidentally dislodged it and they had to put another one back in, doesn't matter where they put it back in, but the patient had a pneumothorax, they put in another chest tube, it would also be counted. Okay. The next one's a question about AQO. Do you want to skip um, that one and go back to Shabby's question? And I can. Yeah, we can skip. Oh, we'll come back to that one. Go ahead. So uh, the next one, I have a patient who the pathologist said the WHO classification was micronodular thymoma with lymphoid stroma. It does not seem to have a letter type WHO classification. Should I leave it blank since there is no other? Yes, please leave it blank. Okay. Um, the next one, so if it is a planned readmission for any reason, whether it is related to the lung surgery or not, is it counted? I feel more confused now. I'm so sorry that I confused you more, first of all. Um, yes, so any planned, preoperatively planned readmissions do not get counted anymore. I apologize for the confusion. Oh, sorry. I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, was there any... Um, uh, sorry, the question. No, you're good. They keep, yeah, they keep moving. Sorry. Uh, right, that, oh, uh... oh, I just realized that I control that cursor. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, we do this. No, you both and I, you and I both. Do. It's okay. No, you're fine. Oh, well, let's see here. So, um, last month's meeting 3670 post op procedures or newer existing incision included only cases that are done in the OR. More clarification is needed. I was not able to make the last call. Was there any clarification if we can exclude procedures that were done in IR bedsides? So in general, the, uh, well, first of all, you can always go back and watch a webinar if you miss it. They're posted on the uh, STS website. So if you have time, you can always go catch the whole thing. Um, but in terms of 3670, the intent is to capture um, major, major procedures, right? So the, um, in 241, essentially, it felt like almost anything, right? Any any procedure was getting captured there. Um, and with the upgrade, the intent was to go back to capturing only things that were major procedures. So if your patient has an emergent surgery done at the bedside because they're too unstable to take them, them to the OR, yes, you would capture it. But we're not trying to capture things like chest tubes or um, I think I got a question this last time around about something like a, a, a blowhole or something being done at the bedside. Um, and the surgeons clarify that that's not intended to be captured. They're really looking for um, major procedures, which mostly by and large are done in the operating room. 
And it's impossible for me to make a comprehensive list um, in anticipation. I'll try to just keep adding in um, procedures that people ask me about to the training manual so that everybody can sort of um, stay appraised. But if that general guidance helps, um, that's the general guidance from the surgeons. Um, okay, we'll skip over the surgeon question. I'll try to make it through the rest of these. Um, I sent this in. Uh, I'm going to read through your question, Shabby, while they answer some other questions because it's yep. long. I'll come back to it. I promise. Yep. I'll and answer. Let me, uh, Tammy, um, thank you, Tammy, for um, correcting me. I had a typo on this slide here. So this should be the 14th. So I apologize. Thank you, Tammy, for catching that. I, I appreciate that. So yes, our monthly webinar is September the 14th. That is a Wednesday. Yes, September 14th. So that fingered that one. So apologize. But yes, September 14th. Um, all right. And let's see here. Let me go. All right. Uh, and to add surgeons, must they be thoracic surgeons? Um, you can add general surgeons for uh, GTSD. I believe that's right, Carol. I'm having a moment. But yes, for you, like your hernia repairs. Yep. That's right. Yep. Thank you. I was having a, a moment there for a second. I was like second guessing myself. But um, but yes, Lillian, you can add um, um, general um, surgeons for those types of like hernia repairs in those cases of that type. Um, and I corrected Tammy's question. Okay. Do, 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 do. And looks like the rest are, um, I can go ahead and, and tackle the AQO question. It says for the virtual AQO, get back to, boop, boop, sorry for the angry scrolling guys. Let me go back here. Let me go to the slide. Okay. So for AQO virtual sessions, what would we have access to during that day if the on-demand is not available to mid-November? and something else being available mid-November. Oh, Emily is back. Um, Hi, eight. so on the yep. day of the conference for the virtual attendees, you would have access to all of the on-demand content. So that would be, yeah, for, for general thoracic, we're gonna have four sessions um, for general thoracic, but you would also have access to the on-demand content for the other, um, the other, uh, databases as well if you're interested in those and then also the general session um, those videos and then you will also be able to vote on e-posters um, so that would be great um, there's we, we have about um, oh I think about 12 to 13 um, being reviewed right now um, yeah and then you would wait until after uh, the in-person sessions happen and those will follow up in mid-November awesome Thanks, Emily. That was perfect timing. I think it was just a, it, it might have, their question might have just been a little confused thinking that AQO wasn't mm. uh, in October this year when it's normally in September. So, oh, okay. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. The um, general thoracic, the, the general thoracic session is scheduled for Wednesday, October 26th. Yeah. Uh, AQO bounces around a little bit between uh, the end of September and then into October. Um, we try to schedule the conference around um, um, some holidays, I believe. Thank you. All right. Um, Ruth, did you want to tackle? Looks like we have a few more questions. Yeah, I'm going to need some time to think about Shabby's question. So if it is in the FAQ mailbox, I will get back to you. I apologize. No, it's um, okay. Uh, and the same with the hydronomothorax question. Um, I'll um, submit that. I think you had asked them to submit that via okay. FAQs and then we can review it with the core group. Um, in terms of what your pathology reports look like and what lymph nodes go into what stations, it's probably best to talk to your, um, your surgeons and your pathologists. So like for example, uh, the anterior mediastinal lymph nodes are sometimes, I think, station three. Um, however, sometimes lymph nodes 
that are documented not with a station number aren't documented with a station number because the pathologist and or the surgeons don't feel like they fit into that station number, you can still include those lymph nodes in your total lymph node count, like number of lymph nodes resected, but then you wouldn't have them um, under a specific um, number if that's the case, if the surgeon or pathologist specifically says, no, these weren't station three, they, they fall outside of that bucket. They belong in, you know, they're just this. Um, so um, you sort of will have to have a conversation with your surgeons and pathologists sometimes about where exactly the lymph nodes were when they use, um, when they don't use station numbers. Sorry, I know that's probably not super helpful, Mindy, but um, it's hard to know exactly where they are when they're just described like that. Yep. I just had another FAQ where the um, somebody uh, asked where anterior lymph lymph nodes were, and the um, and the pathologist felt very clearly like they weren't part of station three. So it's tough. Yep. Mindy said that was very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, and Sheila's got her hand raised, so I, I, sorry, I just saw that. I don't know, Sheila, if you had a question or if that was just by accident, but you're welcome to speak. Um, I unmuted, but you're muted on your end. I don't know, like I said, I don't know if you have a question or not. I don't hear anything. Okay, I assume that was by mistake. But it's been a long time since I heard your voice. Okay, all right. Okay, um, not seeing any additional questions again. Um, just real quick, our next user group calls August 24th at 2.30. Monthly webinar corrected the date to Wednesday, September 14th. Thank you again at 1.30 Central. And then our new data manager webinar for September 28th at 2.30 Central. Um, and I see Ruth is responding to that one. Okay, yep, Ruth is handling the hydropneumothorax question. Uh, oh, no problem. All right. Okay, and again, um, if you guys have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I think that's all that we have for today. Um, if you have any ideas um, or anything you'd like to see that you think would be super helpful in the new data manager webinar, please feel free to send those ideas to myself or Ruth. Um, We'd love to make sure we get that incorporated and make sure we make this new data manager um, webinar the most helpful um, and get everything, try and cover everything that um, that would make um, things easier for our uh, new data managers. Um, also, just wanted to keep in mind that we are still looking for mentees for our mentors for our mentees for, for the databases. So um, if you are interested in becoming a mentor for the database, um, please reach out to us. Um, and I think let me go out, let me show you where that information is. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a mentor um, or a mentee, um, please go out to, I'm sorry, it's been a while since I've been out here. I think it's under database forms. Carol, do you remember where the mentor and mentee information is listed or located? It'd be under the education, data manager. Data education. manager education, thank you. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Mentorship program. It's the second one. Oh, thank you. I'm staring right at it. I don't even see it. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. But yes, yeah. again, we are looking for uh, mentors for, we have several mentees, um, numerous mentees that are waiting for a mentor. And again, um, just need to have a couple of years experience. You don't have to be a majorly seasoned, um, you know, have to have been doing this for like 10 plus years or anything. Just we need someone to to help our newer um, our newer data managers um, navigate the waters. And again, you don't have to know everything. We just um, looking for people to help our newer our newer data managers navigate their their way around the database um, and help them get some questions answered. And then you don't have to know all the answers. Um, but again, we would love to have you all um, apply to be a mentor and if you have any questions about that the program you can reach out to Addie and she could get those questions answered for you um, 
I think that's all that we have for today. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks um, STS team, Ruth, um, and our IQVIA team members. We appreciate you guys joining today. Um, I hope you guys um, have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. And we'll see you guys on August the 24th for our user group call. Um, we'll be approaching the um, near the end of the harvest. So again, if you have any harvest related questions um, prior to harvest close, please be sure to, um, to, to reach out to, to attend that webinar and get Get your, um, get your questions answered. So um, thanks so much, everyone. We hope you guys have a great rest of the week and we will see you guys on August the 24th. Thanks everyone for joining today. We greatly appreciate you.